It's a great pleasure to actually have Mikhail Glasov uh, today with us. He is a leading scientific researcher at the Yaffe Institute in St. Petersburg, Russia. Uh, he obtained his PA, uh, he got his PhD in spin dynamics of electrons and excitons in quantum wells and quantum dots in 2008. And after that, he got a Zabilatazione in 2012. Uh, after that, uh, Mikhail has actually got a lot of awards. Uh, it's a long list. Uh, I think I'll just read out a few uh, important ones, I think, which was basically the IOFA Institute Young Scientist Award back in 2003. And then he won um, several awards from the Russian Academy of Science, uh, Science as well. So it's a great pleasure to actually have Mikhail with us today. And uh, Mikhail today will be talking about Valley Hall effect caused by the phonon and phonon drag. So let us all please welcome uh, Mikhail towards the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the invitation. I would like also to, to thank uh, Ivan Savienko for the invitation and the organization of this workshop. It's indeed a great pleasure for me to be here, or frankly speaking, to stay at, at my home, but being able to communicate to you uh, our recent scientific results, which we obtained together with Leonid Golub at Yoffe Institute. And indeed, I'm going to talk about the Valley Hall effect, which is caused by the phonon and photon drag. And the plan of my presentation is shown here. I will start with a brief introduction. I will try to explain the field of the anomalous Hall effects, and in particular, the Valley Hall effect in two-dimensional semiconductors. Uh, then I will uh, present the model. And finally, I will go to the results, and I will go step by step and present uh, the calculations of the Valley Hall effect caused by a static electric field and also by the photon drag. And then I will discuss the phonon drag effect. And then if I have time, I will also speak a little bit about valley transport of excitons. So let us start. And I will probably start with a very simple uh, picture, uh, which just gives you some flavor of the effects we are going to discuss. So there is a very long history of the Hall effect, which was um, discovered by Edwin Hall back in the end of 19th century. And the effect is very simple. You have a metal, you apply the magnetic field and you apply the electric field, and then you have an electric current across the electric and magnetic fields. Uh, now, uh, already quite soon after the discovery of the, uh, of the Hall effect, of the ordinary Hall effect, which is caused uh, just by the action of the Lorentz force on the charge carriers, Hall discovered what is now known as anomalous Hall effect. So in this case, the transverse of Hall resistivity is not given by the Lorentz force, but has an additional contribution due to magnetization of the particles. So this effect was naturally discovered in ferromagnets, but uh, afterwards there was a long history of experimental research and it was uncovered in many, many materials, including uh, just paramagnetic uh, or non-magnetic substances as well. So at least experimentally, it was clear that there is another contribution to the Hall effect, which is caused by the magnetization of the particles somehow, and which is also definitely should be caused somehow by the spin orbit coupling, because the spin of the particle should somehow couple to the, uh, to the orbital motion. And so generally, if we speak about anomalous Hall effects, or later, a part of anomalous Hall effect was also called the spin Hall effect, is the situation then you have some dragging force, say electric field, but in our case, we will discuss other origins for the dragging force as well. But for instance, the electric field, which drags the particles and creates their flux. But then due to some mechanisms, due to spin orbit interaction, a transversal flux of particles of spin is generated, like it is shown here. So for instance, you have electrons spin up and spin down electrons. You let them go, you drag them by some force. So you may assume that you just have some gradient of potential energy and that is why the electrons are just rolling down. But then due to spin orbit interaction, due to some specific properties of the band structure, these particles with different spins will go to the opposite directions. 
So this is basically what is also known as spin hole effect after the famous work of Diakonov and Perel in 1970s. And this effect has been discovered experimentally in semiconductors already uh, 15 years ago. And of course, there is now a lot of experimental and theoretical activity devoted to this effect. And I would like also to stress that actually it doesn't really matter whether you have a transfer of a spin or any other uh, intrinsic degree of freedom. So in multi-valley semiconductors, you can generate well, valley fluxes. So the particles in different valleys will go to the opposite directions. And this would be the valley hole effect. And I will discuss, of course, the situations, then this effect is important, and then uh, this effect can be experimentally achievable. So typically, then, we discuss the origin of the drag force. People speak about electric field because it is natural. You have electrons, they are charged, so the natural the way to make them move is just to apply an electric field. However, there could be other possibilities, like, for instance, temperature gradient, either of the electron gas themselves or of the uh, crystalline lattice. Or you can have a dragging force due to, for instance, photons or phonons. You can create a, an electromagnetic wave which entrain the electrons, or you can create a flux of phonons which also uh, make electrons move together. And the question, of course, whether the resulting anomalous Hall effect or valley Hall effect or spin Hall effect will depend on the origin of this drag force or not. Just to have some basic picture of what is going on, I am bringing here simple mechanical analogy uh, between uh, the anomalous or spin Hall or valley Hall effect in crystals and something you may very well be aware of just in our normal life. So there is this famous Magnus effect which, for instance, is used by the soccer players, then they want to send the ball not along the direct trajectory, not like this, but they want to, uh, to let ball go along the winding path, like that or like this. So depending on the sense of the rotation of the ball, depending on the direction of rotation of the ball, the trajectory will curve in one or another direction. And in classical physics, you can see in hydrodynamics or in aerodynamics, this is the Magnus effect and its analog in the crystalline physics, in the physics of the solid state is the anomalous or spin hole effect. So let us now move on. I'm going to talk about valley hole effect. So I want to introduce the material systems there we believe this effect would be the most prominent. So I'm going to talk about uh, so-called monolayer 2D semiconductors based on transition metal dehalcogenides. And of course, more, many of you know a lot about these material systems. So I won't, uh, I won't uh, go into much detail, but I just want to remind you that uh, in these materials, probably the, the most prominent example being molybdenum deselenide like this. There are also other materials like tungsten deselenide, tungsten disulfide, uh, molybdenum and tungsten detelluride. So these materials can be made in monomolecular layer form like this with the transition metal atoms in the middle and halogen atoms uh, on top and at the bottom. And uh, these materials are quite famous because the crystalline lattice, if you look from the top, resembles the one of graphene. So it's hexagonal or actually uh, trigonal lattice with a threefold rotation symmetry. And unlike graphene, because you have different atoms that within the unit cell, there is a band gap which opens at the edges of the brilliant zone. So I want to uh, recall that in the very famous works on graphene, it was shown both from the symmetry and also from microscopic calculations that for the hexagonal lattice, you should have these famous Dirac cones here. But in transition metal dehalcogenides, since the atoms within the unit cell are different, the band gap opens, and you have now two valleys, K plus and K minus valleys, which are related by the time reversal symmetry with more or less parabolic dispersion, both in the conduction and in the valence band. So just like in graphene, most of the interesting physics takes place 
at the edges of the brilliant zone, and I will be interested particularly in the transport properties in these valleys, k plus and k minus. So the particles, electrons, holes, excitons, are now valley labeled or valley tagged. So you have this intrinsic degree of freedom valley, one valley k plus or another valley k minus. Both valleys are related by the time reversal symmetry. So there is a connection uh, between the valleys similar to the connection between the spins, like spin up and spin down. They are also related by the time reversal symmetry. And if you neglect the spin orbit coupling, well, actually, if you assume that it is very large, because in these materials, the spin orbit interaction is particularly strong, the effective Hamiltonian, which describes the orbital states in each valley, looks like this. So this is the k linear term, which describes the coupling between the valleys. And this is what you have, for instance, in graphene or any other honeycomb lattice. But also, there is this so called mass term or the term which opens the gap, uh, which provides you the band gap and which eventually provides you the parabolic dispersion. Uh, Mikhail, excuse so, me, I have a yeah. question. Uh, uh, amazingly, our our host allows us all to unmute ourselves. So uh, great. So I'm happy to have questions all the time. Uh, so just a short question. Uh, where's the Fermi energy in these uh, MX2 uh, examples uh, systems, which you presented here briefly? OK, thank you. Uh, your question is absolutely valid. I'm sorry I haven't told this. These are semiconductors. So at low temperatures and in the absence of doping, the Fermi level lies exactly between the conduction and the valence band. Okay, thank so you. valence band is completely filled with electron, conduction band is empty. But you can dope them, there are impurities or there are gated structures, so you can study both uh, electron transport, hole transport, or transport of excitons if you do the neutral system and excite it optically. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So one more step, you are welcome, one more step to understand a bit further the, um, the band structure and the specifics of the system is this slide. I'm not going again to, uh, to discuss a lot of details here, but I just want to mention that um, actually the valleys are chiral in the sense that each of the valleys can be excited by the light of a given helicity, say sigma plus polarized light uh, induces the transitions in K plus valley and sigma minus polarized light induces the optical transitions in K minus valley, which is important if you deal with excitons. So again, by shining light of a given helicity, you can create excitons in a given valley and see how they propagate. Furthermore, I have mentioned that the spin orbit interaction is very strong in those materials. And indeed, you can see that already at the uh, at the edge of the brilliant zone, so in the center of the valley, there are huge spin splittings between spin up and spin down states, both in the valence band and also in the conduction band. So in the valence band, the spin splittings reach hundreds of millielectron volts. In conduction band, they are a bit smaller, about tens of the millielectron volts. However, of course, if you translate it to some magnetic field, you will have, have huge fields. I mean, much larger than you can normally have in the laboratory. Of course, these materials are non-magnetic on average because there is a Cramer's degeneracy between the valleys and say the spin up state here is degenerate with the spin down state in the other valley and the same for the conduction band. But if you somehow focus on a given valley, then you have a situation, then you have huge magnetic field which splits all the electron and whole states already. And this is quite specific. Also, depending on the material, you can control the um, the magnitude and even the sign of the spin splitting, so the order of these spin subnets. But now for a moment, I will forget about it. I assume that, say, the electron Fermi energy is a little bit smaller, so we will deal only with one spin branch here and with another spin branch here. Although, of course, there could be extensions of our model and extensions of our consideration. Now, I have introduced you the band structure of the material. I have convinced you that we are dealing with two valleys, which can be in principle addressed optically. And uh, now I want to introduce you the notion of the valley hole effect or of the valley current. So again, this is the picture I have shown you, but previously the spins, now the valleys. You have electrons, they are made to move in one direction by this dragging force, F drag. And as I will explain due to the spin orbit coupling, the fluxes of electrons in, in the valleys will be separated. If you want to have a vivid picture, of course you can keep the analogy with the Magnus effect because you may just say that, okay, you have the rotation of electron in each valley. The valleys are chiral, so it is like the valley has already some 
kind of external of internal magnetic field. And that is why electrons in one way should go one way, electrons in the other way should go in the other way, and you will have the flux of electrons or current of electrons perpendicular to the dragging force. And you can introduce the valley hole current, which gives you the imbalance of the currents in the valleys, jk plus minus jk minus. And this current can be indeed measured experimentally. I am giving you the reference probably for the pioneering work in this field. For instance, you apply the electric field and you also shine circularly polar polarized light just to populate one valley, say k plus valley or k minus valley, depending on the helicity. And then you can see that there is a whole voltage arises and it changes the sign if you change the sign of the light felicity. So indeed, if you populate one valley, electrons go predominantly in one direction. If you populate another valley, the electrons go predominantly in the other direction. If you use the linearly polarized light, then nothing happens as it should be from both the symmetry consideration and from this simple picture. So the valley hole effect in transition metal dehalcogenides has been discovered experimentally and has been extensively studied actually uh, up to now. There are many experimental works. There are also several theoretical works. And mainly in those works, the effect was discussed in terms of the anomalous velocity. I will probably explain, if you'll ask me, why people do so. But our message is the following. We demonstrate that actually the anomalous velocity plays no role in this effect at all. Its contribution gets canceled. And the effect is solely due to uh, two other mechanisms, the skew scattering and the side jump. And this is the main message of my talk. And now I will try to convince you that this is indeed the case. So now I have, uh, I have finished with my introduction. I have introduced you the phenomenology of the effect and the material system we are going to discuss. And now I'm going to uh, outline the model. And then we will switch, of course, to the results. So I just want to tell you that, of course, we were not the first who studied um, the valley hole effect or the spin hole effect in, um, in various systems. And already back in 1950s, some microscopic theories of the effect were proposed. So I am presenting you several key publications in the field. And actually in all these publications, at least partially the mechanisms were known. And I will just introduce you the main mechanisms behind the effect. Now, afterwards, I will explain you how you can quantify those mechanisms, and then we will see how they combine all together. So I will start probably with the effect, which is very famous and which is very well known already in atomic physics. If you open Landau and Lifshitz course on quantum mechanics and just look at the scattering of electron, say by, by a charge with inclusion of the spin orbit interaction, you will discover that the matrix element of the scattering depends on the mutual orientation of the initial and final wave vector and also on the spin component of electron. So the origin of the effect is of course the spin orbit coupling. This effect was discovered by Mott and the theory has been developed in a very simple way. You can just calculate the scattering matrix element with the proper relativistic wave functions. And the idea is very simple. Depending on the orientation of of spin component, the electron at the scattering by impurity is rotated either to the right or to the left because of the spin orbit interaction. So this effect is known as asymmetric scattering or skew scattering or mod effect. And uh, okay, if you have now electrons in one valley, they will predominantly scatter to one direction. And of course you can get the result for the valley hole current uh, due to the skew scattering in the following form. So F here is the dragging force. Z is the normal to the monolayer and this cross product indeed shows you that the current is transverse. Of course, the current is proportional to the electron density. That's for sure. To the Z, to the, to the Xi, the parameter of the spin orbit interaction, again. Now there is this parameter electron charge divided by the Planck constant, which always appears in the transport problems, in quantum transport problems, but also, and I will explain in a little bit more detail later, 
This contribution contains a large factor because it comes from the kinetic equation. It, it is valid for classical particles as well. So it is the average um, energy of the electrons scattering time divided by the Planck constant. So this is the parameter of good conductivity of the system. But also it contains another parameter, the asymmetry parameter, which is small. And I will explain its origin a little bit later. So just, I want to tell you that this is the most probably obvious reason for the Valley Hall effect. At the scattering by the impurity or by the phonons, electrons in the opposite valleys scatter predominantly to the opposite directions. Once we discuss the scattering and we, once we discuss the transport of, of the particles, of course, we need to think about electrons, not like uh, just classical particles, but rather like the wave packets. And then it can be shown that at the scattering by the impurity of the, or by the phonon, the electron wave packet shifts also in the real space. So here only the direction of the wave vector or direction of the momentum changes, but also, and I will explain the origin in a few minutes in more detail once again, the electron wave packet shifts either to the left or to the right, depending on the valley. And due to this coordinate shift, of course, it, it gets accumulated then the scattering takes place. You get shifts predominantly in one direction and one valley and in the opposite direction and the opposite valley, and you will have the current. And this current has a very simple form. Again, electron charge divided by the Planck constant as it should be. Again, xi the parameter of the spin orbit coupling. Again, the electron density. And again, the, uh, the force field cross the normal to the monolayer. And now, finally, uh, sorry the to interrupt you. We have yeah, a question sure. from Ivan. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, hello, Misha. Uh, yeah, Vanya, so hello. Just, just to clarify, I want to ask if I understand correctly, all these currents which you have so far uh, defined, they're zero if you have pumping of both the valleys, right? So it, it only takes place if you have. Um, some, for example, circular polarization, that's only one valley is uh, excited, right? Yeah. Okay, your question is very good, thank you. So the formal definition of the valley hole current is shown here. So it is the difference of currents in, in the valleys. So if you define it in, in this way, you do not need to have valley polarization because the electrons in one valley go in one direction, the electrons in the other valley go in the opposite direction and this difference is non-zero. Of course, experimentally, it is easier to measure the whole voltage. And in this case, you just uh, populate one of the valleys or another one. And then you can convert this valley hole current to the real electric current. This is what typically experimentalists do. Another option is just to dope selectively the edges of the sample, have no valley polarization of the charge carriers. And then since electron in one valley go to one side of the sample and electrons in the other valley go to another side of the sample, you will get polarization of photoluminescence different from different edges. And this was also done in some experiments on spin hole effect. But in my work, just for my theory, I will finally consider just one valley. So for simplicity, I will calculate the effect in one valley and the valley hole current will be just equal to to this contribution if the valleys are equally populated. Okay. So this is linear transport regime. I'm studying the effect which is proportional just to the electron density. And so it is very easy. So I have explained you the side jump contribution, but there is another contribution. Actually, those contributions are intimately related. Uh, this contribution arises from so-called anomalous velocity. Sometimes it is called intrinsic contribution. Sometimes it is called the contribution due to Berry phase or Berry curvature. And just because of the spin orbit interaction, if you have any potential force, then this potential force enters to the spin orbit Hamiltonian and renormalizes the velocity. And then you get this additional anomalous velocity of electrons, again, which has different opposite signs in the opposite valleys. And if you calculate this contribution, again, up to numerical coefficient, it is the same like the side jump or shift contribution. And in fact, I will highlight further that those two contributions have the same origin and um, the side jump contribution cancels uh, this one. The part of the side jump contribution cancels this one. So 
this is just an overview of what is going on. Now let me give you some, some details. And probably the first thing to do is to show you the Hamiltonian. So we are going to work in the two-band model. I can actually extend my treatment to, to the multi-band case. It is not difficult to just it will just take more time, so I don't want to, to spend uh, my time uh, on this. So the Hamiltonian is here. So this is just massive Dirac Hamiltonian. Gamma is the interband velocity. Uh, and, um, and now I need also to specify the scattering. So I assume that the scattering either takes place by the short range impurities or by acoustic phonons. And actually the scattering potential can be different in the conduction and in the valence band. It is very standard for, uh, for phonons that the scattering is controlled by the deformation potentials. And they are of course different in different bands because of the different symmetry of the bands. But also if you speak about short range impurities, again, they are sensitive to the shape of the block functions. So those two scattering potentials can be different. And actually this difference would be also useful for us to to explain and see the origin of the effect. And now if we have the scattering potential, of course we can introduce the interband scattering matrix elements like this. They are linear in the momentum because only the mixing between the bands allows us the scattering, the virtual processes, then electron goes from the conduction band to the valence band or back. And also in the second order in the band mixing, and here this famous parameter Xi appears as gamma squared divided by the band gap squared, you have this, the asymmetric contribution in the intraband uh, scattering matrix element. And you see, for electron to scatter within the conduction band, of course, it can just scatter due to the conduction band scattering potential, but also due to the admixture, you get this asymmetric scattering, the cross product of the initial and final state, but with the scattering potential in the valence band. So for the short range scattering, you can just uh, rewrite this expression in this way. Uh, the UC is the scattering amplitude in the conduction band. And here you have the ratio of the scattering amplitudes in the valence and in the conduction band. So for the Coulomb impurities, it would be just one. For the phonons, it will be given by the ratio of the deformation potentials. So we got the asymmetric scattering matrix element and we got this parameter Xi. And I also highlight that we work in the lowest order, lowest non-vanishing order in one of the band gap. Although again, the cancellation of the side jump, the partial cancellation of the side jump with the anomalous velocity can be, uh, can be shown and can be rigorously proved in all orders. So we have it here. And now I will start uh, to discuss the particular contributions. And probably uh, I will start with the so-called anomalous contributions, which are intimately related, as I told you, the contribution due to the anomalous velocity and due to the side jump. So let me try to explain you, first of all, the origin of the anomalous velocity. You can probably, the simplest thing is here, this small equation in the middle. I just want to uh, to say that if you have the spin orbit interaction, so the interaction between electron momentum and the external field, the potential field, so the field which really enters the Hamiltonian as the gradient of, of some potential, you have the spin orbit interaction, and now you have the contribution to the velocity just due to this formal formula. The velocity is the derivative of the Hamiltonian over the momentum. So you have the contribution to the velocity proportional to this force proportional to the gradient of the potential. In different values, the sign of the anomalous velocity will be different. So more rigorous calculation is shown here. You need to introduce Berry curvature and you need to introduce the anomalous velocity like this. Actually, these two approaches are equivalent if you be careful and if you just consider accurately the modification of the block functions in the presence of the potential gradient. Actually, also what is interesting here, V is the potential which acts in the conduction band. And so you may say, okay, why do we need anything else? We already have the effect. We have the force field, we have the Berry curvature, so we have the anomalous velocity, which is orthogonal to the, to the force field, and then we, we have the, um, the valley hole effect. You do not need even to have any scattering. You just to get the result, 
and probably this is the main contribution. And I believe it was the problem for many scientists who worked in the field. Now I will demonstrate that this is not exactly the case. You see what happens. Now let's assume that we have some impurities of phonons and we definitely have them because we study diffusive transport, we study normal ohmic response, then we apply the voltage and you have the current which is proportional to the voltage. So I'm speaking about normal diffusive system. In ballistic systems, the situation could be different. So in any case, you have the impurities. And we can assume, for instance, that the impurities provide smooth potential so that you can consider the scattering from these impurities in a quasi-classical approximation. So then we do this. We need to also to take into account the anomalous velocity which arises now due to the scattering potential, due to the scattering force caused by the impurity. And I can calculate how the electron shifts due to this scattering. So it is just a classical formula. The displacement of electron is the integral of the velocity over its trajectory. So we have one impurity and the integration takes over the scattering time. You do this here, you substitute the expression for the anomalous velocity, the rigorous one, but now you take into account that, that the force is not only due to the external field, but also due to the impurity. And you get this. And actually, already this one shows you that you should be very careful because on average, the force acting on the electron is zero. The electron drifts with a constant velocity. The force due to the electric field is compensated by the force due to the impurity. Therefore, you already should have some idea that probably something, something needs to be done carefully and probably some cancellation will take place. Actually, if you now do this quantum mechanically, again, this is the expression for the anomalous velocity. This is the expression for the electron coordinate operator. And this is the expression for the shift of the waste packet at the scattering. So this formula just generalizes the previous one I derived classically to take into account the difference of the scattering potential in the conduction and the valence band. And actually, again, you have this. The, the result is proportional to the, uh, to the spin orbit interaction. And I will show you in few minutes that these shifts, actually the blue part of the shift will cancel exactly the contribution due to the anomalous velocity in the electric field. There is another contribution, I mentioned it at the first place, the, the contribution due to the skew scattering, and it has also its own threats and and cavities and problems. Because you see, you have this matrix element, which we derived already. If I just take an absolute value squared, the term here will just vanish. You will get something quadratic, but due to the hermeticity of the, of the matrix element, uh, then you take the, the absolute value, there will be no interference. Here you have the I, the the imaginary, the imaginary unity. So to get really asymmetric scattering amplitude, you need to go beyond the Born approximation. And the common wisdom is just to consider the third order process or the second Born approximation. Then you write the, uh, the scattering amplitude in the following way. Uh, and the scattering rate is given by the density of impurities, the energy conservation law, two pi over h bar, and then just two first terms of the, of the scattering matrix, like this. And then due to this energy denominator and due to the uh, effect of the, um, of the imaginary uh, unity here, you get the result. This result goes beyond the Born approximation the life is actually even more complicated. This third order process, for instance, is impossible for the phonons, just because the phonons are, provide a kind of Gaussian disorder. And in this case, this third order cumulant just vanishes because here you have the process which changes the number of phonons by one, and here you change the number of phonons either by two or by zero. So th those processes in the case of phonon scattering cannot interfere. So then you need also to take into account so-called two impurity or two phonon scattering processes, the coherent scattering, then you have, you have two pathways 
for scattering at first phonon and then at the second phonon or vice versa. Or you can just write the two phonon processes using the effective Hamiltonian effective matrix element like that. And you can also calculate the asymmetric scattering amplitudes in those cases as well. And actually the fact that you need to take into account two particle, two phonon processes were, were also known both in the context of the anomalous Hall effect and also in the context of photogalvanics back in 1960s and 1970s. So we have now all ingredients. We have calculated the asymmetric scattering amplitude due to the skew scattering, taking into account non-born approximation. Uh, we have calculated the side jump and then we cal calculated the anomalous velocity. And now let us see what is going on with the results. So I'm writing the kinetic equation for the distribution function. And again, I consider several possibilities. I consider the static electric field which just enters as a force field here. It is the simplest possible case and actually the most well-studied one. You can also consider the, the uh, photon drag effect. Then you have the force which oscillates both in space and in time. And then the response should be calculated in the second order in this force field, which gives you the following expression for the drag force at low frequencies. And finally, you can have the phonon drag, which results from the scattering of electrons by phonons, which propagate in one direction, say due to the latest temperature gradient, like this, and the force is given like that. And this force comes from the collision integral between electrons and phonons. So now let us discuss the cancellations. Now I will analyze both the anomalous velocity and side jump contributions in the case of static electric field. And the same result actually would apply for the phonon, for, sorry, for the photon drag effect at low frequencies. So the anomalous contribution takes this simple form. I have already explained you, this is just anomalous velocity multiplied by the electron density and by the electron charge to get the current. And you can calculate it diagrammatically. For example, you get the same result. And now you calculate the contributions due to the side jumps. And there are two contributions. One is very simple and naive. You just have the scattering rates and you have the displacement at each scattering. And this one is shown here. And the current is just the rate of the displacements. But there is another contribution. There in the quasi-classical language, you should take into account the work of the force, of the real potential force, which is included here in the collision integral. And then you can get the second contribution to the side jump current, which actually exactly equals to this first one. And then if you sum up both the anomalous velocity contribution and the contributions to the side jump currents, then you get something which depends on the scattering potential and which exactly, and there the contribution due to the anomalous velocity is exactly canceled. Actually, this unity here and the same unity in the second side jump contribution exactly compensate the contribution due to the anomalous velocity. If you want to have a very simple argument, you can have it. So Bloch electron has the coordinate operator like that. This is the standard part related to the derivative. And this part comes from the Bloch functions. And this part is responsible partially for the side jump and partially for the anomalous velocity. Now, this part, the contributions due to this part actually vanish. Anomalous or Bloch contribution to the coordinate is proportional to the wave vector K. And because of this, the velocity, which is proportional to the derivative of the coordinate over time, is proportional to the derivative of the wave vector over time. And this derivative is zero in the steady state. Again, of course, electron is accelerated by the field, but then it gets. Um, but then it loses its velocity due to the scattering. That is why on average, the velocity is constant. The, you may say it in another way, the average force acting on the, velo on the electron is zero. That is why uh, all contributions related to the anomalous velocity should vanish. The contribution due to the external force field is compensated by the contribution due to the scattering uh, potential. Actually, you can make the same calculation in the presence of oscillatory electromagnetic field. It is a little bit more complicated because you need to go to the second order in the field, but still at least at the low frequencies, the main contribution can be easily picked 
up and you have the same consolation and actually the same result just with the replacement of the electric field by the effective field due to the force, due to the photon drag. Here you get exactly the same result. Um, so Mikhail, this is how something. it works. In... Sorry, Mikhail. Sorry? We have a question from Ivan. Yeah, sure, of course. Uh, Misha, excuse me, just to avoid confusion uh, between uh, different formulas and results. So, uh, for example, on this slide, which is currently active, in the second yeah. line, in the second line, you have three terms in the bolts. Yes, here, unity yeah. and three terms. Yeah. Uh, but also, the blue colored formula at the bottom of the page. It's multiplied yeah. by two, it has a factor of two. Yes, uh, you are right. Because there are two contributions to the side jump. This one, which I have explained probably in more detail, you just have each scattering act and the electron shifts. And this is this first contribution. Now there is the second one, which just equals to this one, it can show it rigorously, which is related to the work of the potential force at the scattering. So you need just to write the standard equation for the anisotropic part of the distribution function, but take into account the force field and side jump in the delta function, which describes you the energy conservation. And then you can calculate this anomalous dis contribution to the distribution function. And with this anomalous distribution, you can calculate additional current which arises. So it is given by the exactly the same expression. It just makes this contribution twice larger. That is why here you have two, if you sum this one and this one, and this two exactly kills this minus two in the anomalous velocity. So, and uh, as far as I understood, the uh, sort of the simplest hand waving uh, uh, in a sense that the simplest physical picture why it happens is that at some point uh, electron stops to uh, accelerate and velocity becomes Yes, you, you can say that the acceleration of electron between the scattering acts is exactly compensated by the uh, breaking of the electron by the uh, reduction of the velocity at the scattering. This is just a condition for the steady state transport. Electron drift with constant velocity, which means that the average force is equal to zero. Of course, the drift velocity is non-zero because external field provides some incoming momentum in the system. And then you have just balance between the external field and the friction force due to the impurities. But you can do it rigorously. You can calculate it diagrammatically uh, or even the even extended kinetic equation approach as it was done by Sinitsyn and co-workers back in 2007. There are also good qualitative and very general arguments about the cancellation of the anomalous velocity given by Michel Diakonov in his famous book. And since we were interested uh, mainly in the drag effects, then you need to calculate either nonlinear response or you need to calculate the, consider the situation. Then you have temperature gradient of the lattice. Uh, then we used Keldish diagram technique and also, of course, we derived all these formulas just within the single approach, just by using Keldish diagram technique, and they give exactly the same result. So we are pretty confident that we are on the on the right track. Okay. Now. Now, again, this static field, I will not go into much detail here. You can also calculate the, the skew scattering contribution, both including the impurities and phonons. And you can compare this skew scattering contribution to the anomalous one, to the one which comes from the side jumps and okay, compensated anomalous velocity. So for, for crude approximation, for the ratio of the skew scattering, to the anomalous contribution, you get this ratio. You get actually the product of two parameters. One is large and another one is small. So the large parameter is the kinetic parameter. Again, the mean electron energy, momentum scattering time divided by the Planck constant. So this parameter is large. It ensures that you really deal with more or less free electrons. The other parameter is small. It controls the strength of the scattering potential. This is the parameter actually for short range scattering. Uh, which is used, then you calculate the Born series. So it is more or less the density of state multiplied by the matrix element of the, of the scattering potential. So in typical situations, the product of those two parameters can be about unity. Of course, it depends on the scattering potential. Of course, if you have short range scattering in 2D, actually everything is strongly enhanced because you have this famous logarithmic singularity. But anyway, one can assume that both 
the skew scattering and the side jump contributions are of the same order of magnitude. If you consider the coherent skew scattering due to two impurities, in the case of short range, actually it turns out that the impurity concentration drops out and this contribution, if you have only the impurity scattering, it will finally kill you what remains here. It has sign minus UV divided by UC. So if you do not have any phonons, this term vanishes. Here you have one and this anomalous contribution is compensated. But this compensation is a kind of, um, is a kind of accidental. It is just for the short range scattering. If you have long range potential, if you have the scattering with the an an anisotropic scattering, then, uh, then this cancellation will not take, will not take place. Now I'm going to speak very briefly in my final probably five minutes about the phonon drag. And here the situation is probably even more simple. You have just the flux of phonons which drag your electrons. So there is no potential force field which acts on the electrons. Everything takes place only at the scattering acts. So all anomalous contributions are only from the side jumps. And then there are two options. Again, as before, one contribution comes from the relaxation. So phonons have formed an isotropic distribution of electrons and then it relaxes and you get the scattering, you get the side jump contribution. It is exactly, has the same form as in the presence of static electric field. But also there is a contribution at the generation just because already if uh, electron is scattered by the phonon, together with the momentum transfer, there could be also a shift. And then you can calculate it all together and you get this expression and it is different uh, from the case of the electric field. So depending on the origin of the drag force, the anomalous current can be different. And this is also a very important uh, remark. So unfortunately, or maybe fortunately for us, there is no universal relation say between the drag force and anomalous current. Each particular situation should be considered uh, on its own. The order of magnitude for the same drag force is of course the same. Again, you can also calculate, you can also analyze some kind of what remains from this cancellation. It is also present here because also again, I recall that there are these contributions with unity which come from the Bloch coordinate, which come from this omega k. And again, you can just show by virtue of the kinetic equation that all the contributions which with these operators omega with the Bloch coordinate vanish. And what remains is something which depends on the form of the scattering potential. And again, this cancellation is fully analogous to the cancellation of the anomalous velocity. And again, it is just because of the fact that in the steady state, the time derivative of the velocity or the time derivative of the wave vector is zero. Finally, you can calculate the skew scattering contribution. It also takes the similar form uh, compare, as compared to the case of the static electric field, but still some coefficients are different. And also because uh, there is an interplay of the contributions at the relaxation processes, which is exactly the same, but also additional term which arises in the course of generation of the current. So together with the transfer of momentum, you already uh, scatter uh, the electrons in one direction. So probably that's it. This is my intermediate conclusion and I will, I'm ready actually to stop here. So first thing, anomalous velocity contribution to the valley, valley hole effect vanishes. Second, resulting valley hole current is controlled by two mechanisms, the side jump contribution and by the skew scattering. And third one, the current depends on the nature of the drag force. So I have a question now to you. I can stop here or I can spend one minute saying that the same results apply to the excitons. You can, you can take your five minutes more actually. So. Okay, so just very quickly. Actually all this story for us was just motivated by uh, the fact that we were interested in, in the valley hole effect for excitons. So for the bound electron hole pairs, as I explained to you, because of the uh, of two valleys, you can excite excitons in each valley by the light of a given helicity. And that is why the, uh, the transport of excitons is, is of high interest, both for theorists and for experimentalists. And actually you can do the same. There are some 
complications because now the exciton is a composite particle. It contains both electron and hole. So you can accurate, you need to write accurately the exciton block function as a product of block functions of electrons and holes with the appropriate weights due to the envelope function of the exciton and draw here is the relative coordinate and also the center of mass coordinate here. You can again calculate the Berry curvature. You can calculate the coordinate, the block coordinate operator. You can calculate the scattering matrix element and now it contains here the difference of the scattering potential in the conduction band and in the valence band. And it is obvious because the, mm, the force which acts on the exciton is the sum of forces applied to the electron in the hole. And for instance, if you have the same force acting in the conduction and in the valence band, then electron and hole will try to go in the opposite direction and the total force will be zero. So, so you have here the difference in the, in the asymmetric part, you also have the factors which uh, depend on the, on the masses. And you have also the contributions due to removed bands. They have the similar form and can be treated similarly. And here you can also have two possibilities. You can either make excitons move due to say phonon drag. You can create the phonon drag or phonon wind and, and train the excitons. Or you can have, for example, in homogeneous strain, we just to provide the potential force in the following way. So xi large here are the values of the, of the deformation potentials. Sorry, Matai. And interrupt. this is just, okay. yes, Sorry sure. to interrupt. There's one question from Ming. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, sorry, I, I just want to ask. Uh, uh, so when you talk about x tons, uh, this holes and uh, electron are you from the same value or from different hole? Okay. I, 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 okay. I, I decided to put it a little bit under the carpet. I'm speaking about, about bright excitons, which are created by circularly polarized light of a given helicity. So within a given value, you have the optical transition. The electron is picked up from the valence band and promoted to the conduction band. The unoccupied state is here in the same okay. way. However, okay, so, if you speak hmm. about the hole, you need to be very careful because you need to take into account the time reversal. So the whole state is actually the state in the other valley. And the argument is very simple. Uh, you create the exciton at the normal incidence of radiation, right? So the mm. average momentum of exciton in this case should be zero, the total momentum. The sum of the electron and hallway vectors should be zero, right? So if electron is created at this edge of the brilliant zone, then hole should be created formally in the opposite edge of the brilliant zone just to have the total momentum being zero. Mm. So if you want to have a formal proof, of course, it is present in many textbooks on semiconductor physics, but you can also draw an analogy between electron hole pair and the positronium, uh, the, uh, the electron and positron. And you know that to get the positron states from the Dirac model, you need at some point to apply the time reversal operation. But if you want to have a quick answer, the answer is as follows. The electron and unoccupied state stay in the same valley. The electron and hole formally reside in the opposite valleys. Okay, thank you. But, 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 but again, I want to say that for us, it is very easy to consider, say, also indirect excitons then um, electron and unoccupied state are in different valleys. So these excitons cannot be excited by light without phonons, but you can see them in phonon assisted processes. And then here, in some cases, some signs will just change. But overall the results will be the same. And actually that's it. We have all the ingredients, then we can make the calculation either using the diagram technique or using the kinetic equation. Again, the terms with anomalous velocity will vanish, the terms with this block coordinate will vanish, and what remains is just a contribution here. And you can also make some predictions, so do not take them very seriously, but in principle, you can make the experiment applying, say the temperature, latest, the latest temperature gradient like this, creating the mm, excitons in the sample, then exciton will diffuse or drift in this, um, in, this, uh, in this drag force due to the phonons. And then you get the, the valley separation of the exciton. So in principle, if you just measure the luminescence, you will see that the spot in one circular polarization and the spot in the other circular polarization will separate in the space. So that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mikhail, for this wonderful talk. Thank you.
So if there are any questions from the audience, uh, okay, we have quite a few. So let's start with uh, Kabya first. So, yes, so uh, when you talk about the, yeah, when you talk about the uh, uh, Hall effect because of the phonon drag effect, so yeah. where is the magnetization contribution to uh, the Hall effect that is coming? Because you said when there is a anomalous Hall effect, there is some magnetization that is there in the model. Okay, let, let me try to explain you once again. So you have two valleys, one valley and the other valley. So you may say that each valley is magnetized. You have electrons here and you have electrons there. So electrons in this valley will predominantly go in one direction, right? The electrons in the other valley will predominantly go in the opposite direction. So if you have already just one valley occupied, then you will have just transversal component of the electric current. If you have both valleys occupied, then electrons in one valley will go to one side of the sample and the electrons in the other valley will go to the opposite side of the sample. So the magnetization, you may say that it appears just because of the population of valleys. The phonons are non-magnetic, like the impurities, they are non-magnetic as well. Uh, so the phonon drag is created because of the temperature gradient, as you said, right? So Yes, you, you have the lattice, the crystalline lattice, and you can easily create the, the gradient of the lattice temperature. Let me just probably, okay, I had, I had this expression somewhere here. Yeah. So you have the latest temperature gradient, then you have non-equilibrium distribution of phonons, which just go from, uh, from the hotter part of the sample to the colder part of the sample. These acoustic phonons propagate and then they scatter the electrons and make electrons propagate together. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Um, let, uh, we have another question. Let's go with Kodo first. Yes, Kodo. Hey, thank you for your talk. Could you show me the page eight? Mm, I can try. Hey, here about the side jump, you told us, so when to, with <coughs> the side jump, there's two direction to left and right, right? R yes. And that depend on in which valley, right? Correct. And also they can be uh, changed by like, I mean, in the case of the photon drag force, I mean, if you also change the polarization, polarization of the light, you can also change the side jump left to the light or it just only depends on the valley. So, um, thank you, it's a good question. Um, so here, we discuss the scattering, say, at the impurity or at the phonon. And here, the direction of the side jump is just fixed by the valley. However, if you speak about the scattering of electron by photon, there could be, a, the situation could be a bit more complicated because already for some specific combination of polarization of light and the incidence angle, you just can have a transverse current. So, Mm, and which can depend, say, on, on helicity of light even, or even for linear polarization, you can have the transverse current. So in this case, the situation would be a bit more complicated. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Kodo. Um, we have another question, Sergei. Um, yes, uh, uh, thanks, Mikhail, for the nice talk. Uh, I have a very simple question first. You mentioned different mechanisms for dragging electrons and you called one the phonon drag and the other one the temperature gradient. In some sense, yeah, I could also get a phonon drag from a temperature gradient, couldn't I? Yes, so I think that I just uh, probably said something not very clearly. So you can have temperature gradient of the lattice and this is what we called phonon drag. I see. But there could be also Zeebeck effect, which is just the temperature gradient of the electron gas itself. And this is a little bit different. Right, right. David, I, I would say that we, we do not fully understand the situation with the Zeebeck effect. That is why I decided not to present the results here. Uh -huh. 
And what is the problem? Can you elaborate? A okay, bit? The, okay, I can, I can just outline the problem. It is very simple. So the question is the following. Do we have anomalous velocity due to the temperature gradient of electrons? So there are a lot of rocks which claim that yes, because the temperature gradient of electrons should be treated just like the external, say, electric field. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, it is still not extremely obvious. And uh, so some work is needed just to, to understand whether it is true or not. Okay. All remaining contributions can be immediately calculated. I mean, the side jump, the, uh, the skew scattering, it is very simple. But if you speak about anomalous velocity, here I am not quite confident and this, this bothers me a little bit. Okay, thank you. And uh, another question, maybe it's related to uh, this uh, uh, temperature gradient uh, issue which you discussed, or maybe not, is uh, what is the impact of uh, interactions, of Coulomb interactions, or in general of electron-electron interactions? Uh, in okay, thank you for this question. Thank you very much. Probably I can give you just one example. There are probably a lot of uh, contributions, but there is one which is very simple. If we speak about valley currents, so the electrons in opposite valley propagate in the opposite directions. Now let us assume that these two electrons scatter and then they start going in the opposite direction. So just the electron-electron scattering itself, despite the fact that it conserves the total momentum of the pair, kills the valley hole current. That is why, in principle, if you want to take into account the electron-electron interaction somewhere, you need to renormalize this effective momentum relaxation time, tau p. So this is probably the first and the most obvious effect. And then there could be other effects, renormalizations, I don't know, whatever. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, um, we have one more question from Ivan. Yes, yes. Uh, Mitra, uh, if uh, to look at this physics of uh, valleys and drags from some more general perspective, uh, what directions of research do you find promising, uh, interesting uh, for yourself now? So what are the next steps which you see as something uh, interesting? Uh, well, I can just tell you about the problems uh, which I do not fully understand. And the one I have already outlined uh, explaining to Sergey, uh, this is the issue of the, the Zebik effect. Probably it is just trivial and probably this is just some my minor misunderstanding. Uh, also, I think it is probably more important for experimentalists, but not for us. It is, it is important to have in-depth studies, experimental in-depth studies of these effects, because so far, at least for 2D materials, uh, we had just several, but just first experiments with uh, with no separation of the mechanisms, with no in-depth analysis and so on. So I believe that new experiments in this field, if they appear, then of course uh, they will promote somehow theoretical research. But for us, so we are mainly working now to finalize our story with excitons. There are just interesting additional uh, consolations and additional uh, additional beautiful aspects coming from the fact that you have both electron and hole and they should scatter together. And also in principle, of course, this, we think um, a little bit about the Zeebeck effect. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Let, let's have just one last question from Kodo and then we can carry on if there are any further questions in the discussion session. So, uh, Kodo. And could you show me the page 15? 15, okay. Yes. So in this photon drag force, so about this Q parallel, the wave vector of the light. Yes, the projection on the, on the monolayer plane. So this is the oblique incident light, right? Yes, yes, because at the normal incidence, of course, you can have no drag. There is no preferential direction. Uh, so in the normal light, uh, with normal light, uh, there is no photon drag force and only oblique incident light, there is photon drag yes. force? In, in, in 2G system, there is no force just for the ob obvious reason, just for the symmetry, yes? Your, your light is going like this. I, I hope that you can see my hands. 
and yes. but the current should go somewhere in the plane and this is impossible due to the transfer of the wave vector so you need to consider an oblique incidence and then uh, there are different contributions so this one just is the main you see it contains omega in the denominator it is the largest one if you go to low frequencies then the product of frequency by the momentum scattering time is much less than unity okay thanks You're welcome okay great so uh, thank you misha once again for this wonderful talk uh, let us thank all you. thank misha for this talk